Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is one of the most wonderful of all the plant-based doctors. He's been on the show before, and he will be on the show again, maybe even as a regular slot if you guys end up loving him as much as I do. He's going to be doing a Q&A of questions that you sent in advance. His name is Dr. Ron Weiss, and please welcome to the show. The doctor is in. Nice to see you, Dr. Weiss. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Chef AJ. Oh, you're so welcome. I, I got to ask you, there's there's something hanging over your left shoulder. I, I don't oh, know what that is. is. Oh, that's my, uh, yes, that's, uh, we're going to, we don't want any accidents here. And so we're going to take that down. It was just a strap, an assist strap for pulling. I thought maybe it was some strange medical device that you were no, uh, torturing, we, we, torturing we your patients. It was not that strange. Torturing your patients with. So, you know, in case people are not familiar with you, Dr. Weiss, maybe just spend a few moments telling us who you are in general and who you are in the plant based world. Sure. Uh, well, I did um, a, an academic medical training uh, uh, at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, then um, at George Washington in, in uh, DC. I, I did internal medicine as my postgraduate training. And it was all very, you know, uh, academic conventional medicine until my father was diagnosed with end stage pancreatic cancer. Uh, and this was uh, when I was a new doctor, I was one year out. And then I was exposed to um, the, a macrobiotic diet, which was, you know, a, a kind of a whole food plant based diet. And uh, he we put him on this diet. He had an amazing uh, transformation instead of living 90 days he lived for about a year and a half and had an enormous quality great quality of life he reduced his tumor size by about 50 percent in all of his tumors just by eating these plants so that was my portal of entry for realizing that plants were powerful as medicine and and over the years you know i i, I was an emergency room attending for about seven years at a, a busy single coverage uh, inner city emergency room. And then I opened up a, sort of a comprehensive primary care, um, primary care, multi-specialty, urgent care, just everything, a uh, little medical practice um, in, in New Jersey and Hudson County. And, um, and that's where I realized that most of the chronic diseases that I had taken care of in the emergency acute state in the emergency room, I was now getting the, the opportunity to see in patients in their lives, you know, as they were living. And I realized that put two and two together and all this stuff was due to food. So I decided to go from there to the farm. We closed that practice and we, um, opened on a farm and why a farm you ask because that's where a food system begins it's where the food for the community begins and i i wanted to start with the creation of a, a healthy food system and so that's what we do today my uh, primary care practice is in the middle of the growing fields of a beautiful 300 year old national historic landmark farm and uh in case anyone has missed it, <laughs> we are having our first annual Farm Days Festival. Um, and that's a week from this uh, next weekend, a week from today, or, you know, eight days from today. So you're all welcome. And I, I believe the contact information and how to find out about that is on the, on, in the chat. So it's actually in the show notes right below, but we, I'll also make sure that I paste it in the chat. Where did you hear about the macrobiotic diet in the first place that ultimately helped your father live a longer life? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, as I told you, I was just, uh, you know, this was devastating to us. My father was, the, you know, the head of the family. We had six children in our family. They were all do doctors or dentists or lawyers. And out of the blue, all of a sudden, he, we were told that he was given this death sentence. I had taken care of many patients like him during my residency on the cancer ward. I'd given that chemotherapy. I knew that everyone died. Like, and usually within six months, they were dead. 
he was late stage. Most of his liver had been replaced by tumor already. So I moved home to take care of him. And I was so desperate. I didn't know what to do. At, at this time, I don't know if you've ever heard of Andrew Weil, you know, the alternative medicine doctor. He was just beginning to make headlines. This was his era. And so I figured, huh, no one ever taught me about alternative medicine. Maybe I'll just go down to the public library and I'll start reading about. It. And there was a book of shelves on alternative medicine. All, like Andrew Weil was there and then there were Chinese herbs and acupuncture and all these things. Like, you know, uh, Laetrile from almond pits. And, you know, so um, I, it didn't, you know, that these things seem to be, you know, not... They didn't seem to be something I could connect to, but there was a book on food and it was, a, it was about um, testimonies of uh, cancer patients who had survived their cancer eating a macrobiotic diet. And in that book was the testimony of a man with the last name of Arnold, who was at the sta same stage my father was. He, uh, he was under the treatment of Michio Kushi, who was the, um, he was the head of the, um, the head of the macrobiotic movement in the United States. And he not only survived, he cured himself. And he went on to found the University of South Carolina School of Public Health. He, his name is on it. He just passed away about two years ago. And this was like 30 years ago that this happened to him. So I brought home this book. I let my father read the story and he said, I want to do this diet. So we took him up to see, I made an appointment with Michio Kushi. Well, no, 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 no. First, I made an appointment with Elaine Nussbaum, who was one of his protégés, who was local to us, like in West Orange, New Jersey. And she had had a rare, very malignant endometrial cancer, which was, which was widely metastatic, like to her lungs and her spine. In fact, she had spinal cord compression and she had been in a wheelchair. And so I took my father to see her first and she was sitting at the desk walking around and she was a normal person. I said, you're, you don't have stage, you don't have like spinal cord compression with like cannonball lesions in your lungs. She said, not anymore. I didn't because I ate, I changed my topic. And I found that so unbelievable Although I didn't really believe what, you know, I took what I was reading in the book with a grain of salt. I found that so incomprehensible because I had never seen anyone with solid tumors with that widespread stage four who had complete remission. I know it can occur, but I decided to make an appointment with Michio Kushi, her mentor. And I took my father up there. He was in Boston. That's incredible because you've had personal experience of people having improved outcomes with cancer, yet so many people say when they get cancer, their oncologist says, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. Well, uh, it matters a lot what you eat. Now, now, let me just say this. Out of all the illnesses that we are confronted with, as a, a plant-based whole foods doctor is confronted with, cancer is the most difficult. And... Um, uh, I think that in my mind, that's the number one reason. That's why I eat a plant-based whole food diet because I do not want to get cancer. You know, Dr. Esselstyn and Dean Ornish have shown us that it's possible to reverse even if you have severe artery disease. We all know people who can reverse rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis, like Dr. Stansick, right? And, and all kinds of diabetes, Robbie and Cyrus, right? Well, everyone can, almost all of these illnesses are eminently reversible, but I do not find that that's usually true with cancer. Once in a while, on occasion, in my experience, you can reverse it or improve the life of the person who has it. But once you have it, it's a difficult disease to deal with. However, I know even in all of our late stage cancer patients that even if they cannot reverse the tumor size, they definitely have increased, um, they have an ability to improve their performance status. 
what is a performance status of a cancer patient? Performance status is the, basically it's the rigor, your general health status and strength of the patient who is battling cancer. Like how much can you move? How much can you exercise? How, how vibrant and vital are you? And, and the other thing that's important to remember is if there is a conventional treatment want, that you want to um, engage with, whether it be a surgery or chemo, that performance status is really important to make sure that you do well. So I believe whole plant foods improve, I know that they improve cancer patients' performance status. Great, well, thanks. You ready to jump into the questions, Dr. Rice? I am. All right. Well, okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. And guys, the best way to get a question answered by any guest on Chef AJ Live, particularly a doctor, is to send it in in advance by simply subscribing at chefaj.com. Once a week, we send you this schedule of all the guests and simply respond to that email for who your question is for. This question was sent in from Belinda. Can a whole food plant-based diet help with dandruff? My son is experiencing dandruff, but doesn't eat this way. Um. Yes. Well, you know, the first thing that pops into my head when you ask this question is uh, Ruth Heydrich, uh, our friend in Hawaii, who is featured in the Forks Over Knives movie. And if you watch, uh, there is a beautiful uh, segment of that movie that tells her whole story of how she, she reversed under Dr. McDougall's care she reversed a late stage metastatic breast cancer by eating whole plant foods and cured herself. And she comments in the movie to, to, as an extra bonus, not only did I reverse my metastatic breast cancer, but I got rid of my dandruff. And, and what dandruff actually is, the, the lay person's terminology is dandruff, but the, the medical terminology is seborrhea. Uh, and it means like a drying flakiness of the skin. And I definitely have noticed that in my patients who adopt a whole plant, whole food plant-based diet, that they either greatly improve or can completely resolve seborrhea or dandruff. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Next question is from Marisol. It is about untreated sleep apnea. Dear Dr. Weiss, my husband who has been whole food plant-based and SOS free for over 20 years has sleep apnea. He is extremely thin. He refuses to wear his CPAP machine because he says it's uncomfortable and he complains every day how tired he is. He does not believe me that that's the reason he's so tired and I might add cranky. He never has a good night's sleep. Can you please talk about the risks of untreated sleep apnea? I heard that it greatly increases a person's risk of both stroke and Alzheimer's. If that's true, by how much? Thank you. Oh, there is so much to say here. How many hours do we have, Chef AJ? Uh -huh. Well, we usually go about okay. an hour. <laughs> okay. So, but just to maybe summarize, um, um, if any of you have ever listened to uh, Dr. Matthew Walker, he's the, he's the preeminent sleep scientist from UC Ber Berkeley. Um, who wrote the book, a recent book, a couple of years out, it has been Why We Sleep. Um, you will read in that book that he calls sleep the Swiss army knife of our health. And um, I was particularly impressed after listening to a Rich Roll interview with him, which ran for about three hours. And um, at, you come away from this interview with Dr. Walker understanding that you know, all of us in the plant-based world who really hold, hold fast to the staff of plants as, as, as the staff of life, right? Know how powerful it is. But after you listen to Dr. Walker, you begin to realize that it can all be undone by poor sleep. You can eat as many plants as you want, but if, if your sleep is not correct, it will be undone, all of your health. It doesn't matter how thin you are. It doesn't matter what plants you're eating. And the reason why 
is because when people have sleep apnea, they basically are starving their tissues and their brain for oxygen. Um, if somebody has sleep apnea enough to need a, uh, a CPAP or device, um, they will be having, they probably are having oxygen saturations lower than if you had COVID. And, and you know, those are, those are pretty low. low. The lowest saturations I've ever seen in a living person who was walking around was at the beginning of COVID. So in any event, um, it causes everything from, my immediate concerns for your husband would be, um, you know, it causes um, uh, this deoxygenation, uh, causes a lot of problems. It, 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 it causes our bodies not to be able to repair ourselves during the night, during these critical periods where we go down and it's a body's uh, and brain's repair mechanism. It, we know that it will lead to things like uh, increased pressure on the heart. Um, it can cause pulmonary hypertension, which is a devastating disease of which there is very poor treatments. It's lethal. Um, it can cause atrial fibrillation. Uh, it can cause hypertension. It causes us to be insulin resistant. Uh, it, it can cause um, dementia in the long term. So, and it can cause heart attacks eventually. So uh, my advice to your husband would be to, to do anything he can to um, address the sleep apnea. Uh, we do have patients who have difficulty wearing the devices. Um, I think if your husband is thin, it's important to look at what, what is the mechanism exactly of his um, sleep apnea. Does he have upper airway problems where his jaw falls back, his tongue perhaps falls back into his throat? It, sometimes if that's, a, that's a major cause of sleep apnea in, in people who are non-obese, who are thin. And if that's the case, sometimes what you can do is if you lie on your front or if you lie to the side, the tongue does not fall back and obstruct your throat. And then that could be a major solution to, you know, to not having sleep apnea. But I don't know the, the, the fineries of your husband's case. Um, I would advise you to go to a, to a well-trained sleep specialist and just make sure that this is solved. It's not acceptable. I, I believe Dr. Matthew Walker says it's like in a medical emergency. If you know somebody with sleep apnea and it's not being addressed, go get it corrected now. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah. So this question was sent in by Melissa. Can you please ask Dr. Weiss about H. pylori, how it's contracted, treated, and how to recover after treatment? How many hours do we have? No, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, um, so Helicobacter pylori, uh, is, uh, is close to my heart because I was in medical school when it was discovered. And, and I began medical school and nobody, it was not a thing. Nobody knew what it was. And then it was discovered, I believe, by a medical student in somewhere in like in Australia or New Zealand. And this medical student, maybe I have some of the details, right? Because it's been about almost 40 years since I know this. I believe they thought he was nuts when he said, I have discovered this bacteria in the floors of, of ulcers in the stomach. And I believe it is the cause that this bacteria is causing stomach ulcers. Now you have to remember that this was earth shattering to the medical establishment, but because before this, we were taught that ulcers are due to stress that it's due to your genes, that it's due to family inheritance. You know, your father had stomach ulcers, you'll have stomach ulcers. It's due to too much acid. People used to take bicar. And to, for this medical student to say, oh my God, I, I think it's due to an infection. He was basically almost drummed out of medical school until uh, just a few years later, after I graduated, I remember receiving a bulletin from the CDC, our own CDC, for people to doctors to post in their office, 
educating all patients that uh, stomach ulcers are due to an infection called Helicobacter, uh, Helicobacter pylori and that they can be cured by taking a complex um, schedule of antibiotics. So um, that appears to be pretty much true, everything that I told you now. Um, the question of where, how did you get Helicobacter pylori and who has it and do you, is it possible to have it and not know it? But these are very vague vagaries uh, of these questions. Um, there is an amazing article. If you ever want to read it, it was written by the food um, journalist, Michael Pollan. And it, it appeared as the, as the cover story of the New York Times Magazine about five or six years ago. And it, it, the, it was called Germs. And he discusses, um, uh, he was interviewing, um, I believe it was the Sonnenbergs, who are famous microbiologists out of uh, Stanford. And they were discussing the history of H. pylori. And the amazing thing is, it's not, the history of H. pylori is not as clear cut as we think. This medical student did find an association with the causation of stomach ulcers. And afterwards, we did find an association with the development of stomach cancer, a specific cancer called lymphoma of the stomach, if this bacteria is present. However, there's a lot of information showing that it's critical, that it plays a critical role in the digestive processes of children and that, um, that children who are missing H. pylori get, get to be very sick, as a matter of fact. And so now with all of this um, treatment that we go about the world in, in eradicating H. pylori from adult stomach, uh, stomach um, linings, uh, it is estimated that Helicobac Helicobacter pylori may be in threat of, um, of being extinguished, of going extinct in our world, that bacteria, because we're attacking it so viciously and we don't know what this means. So I just wanted to give you all that information. It's very interesting. Again, if you want to read about the background of H. pylori and how we get it, you can read that germs, just Google germs, Michael Pollan, P-O-L-L-A-N, New York Times, You'll see the whole thing and the history of it. In the meantime, uh, if you do have a gastritis and it is found, and, or if you have a stomach ulcer and this bacteria is found, it is recommended that you take a very complex, like 14 day course of combo, combo antibiotics. Uh, we do not like antibiotics because it disrupts the gut, the good gut microbiome. But at this point, Without further information, I would advise you to take this. And then afterwards, you should do everything you can to fortify and restore your gut microbiome. Would you like to know how to do that? Yeah, we eat by eating the plants that you grow on the farm. Right. Well, I think there are two sorts. There, there are a few answers to that. Number one, eat whole plant foods and eat a diversity of them like as many different kinds of whole plants you can eat because each one of them have different components in it that support different animals down there in the ecosystem of our gut. So uh, as Colin Campbell says, you want that symphony of nutrition. It's just like everything, as many different plants as you can have and not animal foods. Animal proteins and animal foods cause a skewing of your ecosystem towards undesirable species. You want whole plant foods. Number two, um, uh, I uh, like to tell, I'm, you know, um, the Kodo millet, uh, I like to often tell patients to eat as a grain if they have gut microbiome problems because of all grains, it has the most resistant starch and we found out that that starch ends up pretty much undigested until it reaches your colon and then your gut microbiome has a field day with it. 
So I like incorporating that into patients' diets who need microbiome assistance. The other thing you can do is you can um, be attached to a healthy soil. Make sure your vegetables and your produce and everything that you eat was grown in a microbiome rich soil because that's where our microbiome comes from. A good healthy, we come from the soil, right? I mean, if you wanna believe Adam, Adam, right? From the Bible came from dust. Uh, we come from the soil, we are attached to the soil. And uh, the a lot of these um, organisms that people try to take like lactobacillus, like they'll go to the pharmacy, right? And get a bottle of lactobacillus acidophilus as a probiotic. Guess what? It's a soil bacteria. Uh, and a lot of the bifidobacterium, it's a soil bacteria. So you can get these things by pulling up a radish or a carrot. I just wipe it out of a good soil, mind you, one that's living. I wipe it off with my hand. And here on the farm, we don't wash things. We just, we just eat them. And I just crunch on it. I do that once a day. And this way you can replenish. You have a good reservoir to replenish your own microbiome. Now, well, you don't wash it, but if like there's actual like bugs crawling on it. No, there's not bugs. I, you know, I, we don't have water in the field. I, I, I hand wipe it. You know, there's not dirt on it. It looks, it looks a little dirty, but you can't taste dirt. And then I just eat the whole thing. I don't cook it because then you'd kill you'd kill, boil the bacteria, you'd sanitize it. So I like to eat it raw. And by the way, even for non-root vegetables, like for leafy vegetables, we know that on, on health, um, like lettuces that come from healthy regenerative soils, they have a completely different microbiome than conventional lettuces. Nice, thanks. From Aurora. My husband, who had a heart attack in 2018, follows a plant-based diet. He has always had trouble keeping weight on. What can he do to add weight without eating foods such as nuts, avocados, or oils? Or do you think eating these foods in moderation is okay? <sighs> well, um, so I do not know of a patient. Um, uh, this, um, this young lady doesn't tell us what the... BMI of the, her husband is, does she? Or no, but I, you know, I wonder. She, I, if you're watching live, maybe you can post it in the chat. But you know, I get a lot of people that that ask me how how they can gain weight, and they're I, I wouldn't I don't think of them as even thin or too thin. No, that, well, that's why I'm asking. I I see a lot of patients who come in who, who then think they're too thin, and they're not too thin. It's like <laughs> they're looking at everyone around them who is overweight, which is what America's problem is. And then everyone else around them is saying, hey, you lost too much weight, you're too big. And they may have a body mass index of 22 or 21, 21, 20, which is perfect. So why, why would you want to gain weight? So maybe if you can, you know, I, I would say, um, first of all, I would want to know this gentleman's actual height and weight. Um, if she wants to respond back, and, um, and then we can calculate the body mass index if she doesn't know. But so if my first answer is, if you have a body mass index of, of 20 or 21, that's optimal. You, you, you don't want to gain weight from that. Uh, if you want to gain weight by building your muscle, that's okay. But you don't want to gain weight by eating more calories and fat. That wouldn't be a good idea. Okay. If, if you have a body mass index of like, let's say 19 or definitely 18, 19 is okay, is, is acceptable, but below 18, th that's a problem. And, and um, I, what I would do is I would eat, as you would advise Chef AJ, whole plant foods, because there are plenty of whole plant foods, which are very high in calories. They're calorie dense. And so, uh, and those include starches, whole starches like beans. Beans have a lot of calories in them, legumes, corn, you know, whole grains, hemp seed, you know, seeds, nuts are tremendously caloric. I mean, 
And, um, you know, avocados have a lot of calories. So, you know, every there's different individuals have different needs. Once in a while, we do have patients and, um, you know, everyone would be very jealous of them knowing that they have to eat avocados so that they can keep their weight on, but it's okay. It's okay. Whole plant foods, calorie okay. dense. That's what I would focus on. What about the idea of building muscle as a way to gain weight? Why, why do people think it's food is the only way you can gain weight? Uh, right. I don't, because um, I guess uh, they're not, um, I think that they basically have to be exposed to the tenets of lifestyle medicine. So, and one of those tenets is movement nutrition. It's not only plant-based whole foods nutrition, it's movement nutrition. And when we move correctly and load enough weight, we will build muscle. So I, that's a good point to you, right? Nobody wants to have extra fat to gain weight, right? You want to have extra muscle to gain weight. So don't do it by having refined fats like oils. Yes, that will get you to gain weight, but it'll also, it causes your coronary arteries to go into spasm again. So I, I, I wouldn't do that. Great, thank you. This is a question from Monique. Is interstitial cystitis an autoimmune disease and what is the best treatment for it and do bladder installations help? Mm. So, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by, mean by bladder installations, maybe installation, installations, maybe by putting some a liquid in the bladder, but um, uh, you know, interstitial cystitis is a very frustrating condition. Uh, it's been around for a long time. And uh, we can basically, uh, it's, its causes are a little mysterious. Uh, we know that it can cause very bothersome urinary symptoms, anything ranging from pelvic pain to uh, problems urinating to urine hesitancy to urinary frequency. You have to keep going to do dysuria, painful urination. You know, it's in that neighborhood of lower pelvic um, symptoms. And uh, basically when, uh, and they're usually women who have this condition predominantly when they show up at the doctor, they'll think, oh, I have a UTI, you know, because I'm going to the bathroom peeing a lot and it, it hurts when I pee. But repeated urine cultures and urine analysis are negative. They do not show any infection. And when that happens, then the next step is a urologist will go and generally do a cystoscopy on you, which means they'll put a tube up your urethra into the bladder, and then they'll take some, they'll look around and take biopsies, and they show that there's this inflammation level in the lining of your bladder. And that defines it as interstitial cystitis. It causes for many years have not been clear. Um, however, in more recent years, um, it is thought that, um, that interstitial cystitis may have as a root cause abnormal tone of the muscular slings of the pelvis. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, if there are any medical students out there who've ever been through gross anatomy <laughs> or residence, they've had to cut, dissect the pelvis. It's very complicated down there with a lot of planes or slings of muscles, very strong going this way and that way. Uh, when women have babies, we know they can be disrupted because from the weight, the weight and the force of childbirth, these slings can get flabby and then you can get... Um, protrusion of the, the vagina or the uterus or the bladder, that's called prolapse. So the, um, in this condition, in interstitial societies, we think that there's not prolapse or weakening of these slings, but they perhaps become too spasmodic. They become too tense. And when that happens, they cause um, around the neck of the bladder, they can cause undue pressure and inflammation of the bladder and then this condition developed. Yeah. So um, I, when I have patients who are diagnosed with interstitial cystitis, um, my treatment of choice um, 
One of them is to uh, recommend uh, relaxation, relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles. And I think that that probably is the best treatment at this point. Um, and relaxation uh, can be done through pelvic floor therapists. It's a kind of physical therapist and all they work on is those muscles. They don't work on shoulder muscles and back muscles and ankles. They only work on your pelvic floor. Um, believe it or not, uh, mindfulness practice and stress reduction which is a main pillar of lifestyle medicine, which is the kind of medicine that I practice, can be an equally powerful tool in, in being used to relax those pelvic muscles. So the bottom line is, I think that um, concentrating on relaxation of those pelvic floor muscles would probably be a good answer for you. Great. Thank you. Well, those were the ones that were submitted in advance. So we can go to the chat now. And the first question I'm seeing, please put four question marks, is, uh, is there any proof that a whole food plant-based lifestyle can stop or re reverse idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Hmm. Well, that is a very good question. Uh, there is no proof or a, a, a data that I'm aware of. That, um, that a whole food plant-based diet can stop or reverse pulmonary fibrosis. But I, this is one of the questions that I am most eager in trying to address uh, in my patient population. I am waiting for a patient to come to me uh, and to treat them with whole food plant-based lifestyle to see if it can be arrested and reversed just for those of us who, who aren't aware of what pulmonary fibrosis is. It is a, it is a, it is a disease where the, their scar tissue progressively develops in the lung. Um, you know, it's a, it, it is a progressive disease. We really don't have good treatments for it. It can often end up in lung transplantation uh, because, you know, it makes the lungs unable to oxygenate the blood. Um, it is uh, thought, you know, I think that there may be some autoimmune component to, to, um, to interstitial, this interstitial fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis. And that's why, you know, autoimmune diseases, all of them where the body is attacking itself with its immune system, whether it be multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, those diseases are best treated with a diet of whole plant foods. So I would, I would welcome any patients, if you know them, or if you, if you want to um, try going on a diet of whole plant foods, I would, I would welcome trying to help patients like this um, and welcome into our practice. So how can you, the question is, if you were to adopt a diet of whole plant foods, what would be the plan? How could we measure to see if it was improving your situation? And uh, I would be looking to, for improvement in pulmonary function testing because in the pulmonary function testing is the functional breathing test that the pulmonologists do to, to, in, in the diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis in addition to imaging studies. And look, if, if you adopt a diet of whole plant foods and you see a, a rest uh, or, uh, of, the, of the decline of pulmonary function, and definitely if you see improvement in it, wow, that would be evidence that you are, you know, you're reversing the pulmonary fibrosis. Nice, great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Gina, a live viewer asked if, how do you know how much stomach acid you have and is reflux due to too much or too little? Mm. Well, um, you know, um, we never think about, <laughs> In the whole food plant-based world, we never concern ourselves with how much stomach acid we have or don't have because it's just a non-issue. It doesn't matter. Uh, as far as I'm 
I can see in my patients, the patients will come in with a lot of stomach acid problems, but if they adopt a diet of whole plant foods, they never have stomach acid problems ever again. It doesn't matter if they have hiatal hernias or this or that anatomical, you know, feature, it just doesn't matter. So stomach acid is really strong. If you put some stomach, if you took some of your stomach acid and dumped it on top of the, your, the hood of your car, you probably would come out in a day or so and see the paint being eaten away. It's really strong, but it's, it's there in the amounts it needs to be and, and in its low pH and its acidic nature for a reason, two reasons that we know of. Number one, it's supposed to break down food so you can absorb it adequately and get nutrients and build yourself and make yourself healthy. Number two, when you chew food in your mouth, we talked about the microbiome before. Your micro, you know, we were talking about the microbiome of your lower gut, which is basically very, very important to direct your general health status and to make you healthy or, you know, predict whether you're going to get disease. However, you know, you have a microbiome in your mouth and those organisms are completely different than uh, the microbiome lower in your gut. And you do not want those bacteria. When you chew food, that mouth bacteria gets embedded in your bolus, in the, in the chewed up food that you're swallowing. It goes down your esophagus. It drops into the stomach. The purpose of that acid is to kill those mouth bacteria. Your body doesn't want them seeding into the lower gut because when it does, it can cause all kinds of problems. There's a... There's a theoretical disease. Well, some GI, you know, some GI doctors do not believe it's theoretical, but it's called small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, SIBO. And, you know, that's, that's a problem where you have abnormal bacteria growing where they shouldn't. A lot of them may be mouth bacteria. So you want, you want the acid that, that your creator gave you in your stomach. You don't want to make it less. Don't worry about it. The fantastic thing is, and by the way, we have all these space, you know, these modern drugs like Prilosec and Nexium and Asifex and, and Protonics. They're called the PPI, the proton pump inhibitors. Then you have like the older ones, the Zantax, the Pepsids, the Tagamets. All they do is they shut off stomach acid. You don't want to do that because we know that it, at least in the case of the, the stronger, more efficient ones, the Prilosec class, it, it can cause, if you do that and you decrease your stomach acid, it can, it can associate with osteoporosis. And as I said, uh, the development of bad you know, ecosystems in your gut. So don't worry about how much stomach acid you have just eat a diet of whole plant foods. And I, if you're like all the other patients I've seen, I don't think you should ever have a complaint again. Yeah. You know, whole plant foods, I, I, I see so many people telling me they're whole food plant based or exclusive, and yet they eat things that are not whole, like oil, like alcohol. Yeah, oil know? causes stomach problems. O oil causes GERD. I, you know, D Dr. Clapper has this fantastic GI uh, um, lecture where he shows that the oil in the stomach helps to open up the gastroesophageal sphincter. That's the door that closes off the stomach from the esophagus. Then you get that acid going up there. Don't have oil and don't have alcohol because alcohol, you know, inflames the stomach and then you get stomach problems from that. Yeah. And don't have, don't have coffee. So those even those are three things that I find that even plant-based people will indulge in. I didn't say plant-based whole foods, but at least vegan people, they'll have alcohol, they'll have coffee, they will have oil. And all three of those, um, I find really they cause uh, heartburn, stomach, and gastritis, stomach problems. Yeah. Now, just, just to mention uh, in the old days in medical school, I was always taught by the GI doctors, the conventional ones, that people with too much stomach acid, they should stay away from tomatoes, 
the tomato family, tomato sauce, you know, garlic, onions, peppermint, things like that. And I know that's the old wisdom, but I have never seen it hold true in someone who adopts a whole food plant-based diet. And even if these problems, these foods did bother them in the past, when they eat whole food plant-based foods, they can have plenty of onions, garlic, and uh, tomatoes. And oh, citrus was the other one. Citrus doesn't bother them. Wow, thank you. Peter, who's watching live says, considering I eat a plant-perfect diet, However, coffee raises my cholesterol level by 100 points. Can it alone raise heart disease risk? There is no evidence that it, that it raises, in and of itself, that it raises heart disease risk. We've been trying for decades to, uh, to nail coffee. And, you know, there's just not strong evidence that that is so. And actually, there is some evidence that it is beneficial in some ways to our health. Uh, however, um, you know, I recommend that my patients not drink coffee for other reasons. And, you know, in, you are correct in some uh, patients, especially if it's a French roast coffee, it can increase your LDL. Um, but like I said, we, we just talked about in people with gastric gastritis or stomach acid problems, it well, does open up that valve. Or I hear it's terrible for people with bladder problems like interstitial cystitis. Yeah, it can. And it can also, guess what? In people who have prostatitis, which is in that area too, uh, you know, prostatitis, interstitial cystitis, they all have to do with uh, tightening of those pelvic floor slings. We think that caffeine aggravates or coffee aggravates these things. So yes, prostatitis, your excellent point. Thank you for making that chef, AJ. So because there's these sneaky things that are lying around with coffee, but I think the sneakiest of them is the following. Why do you have to, the question is why do you have to drink it? And people will say, I think if you ask most people that, they say that it gives them energy or it, they like drinking it because it, you know, perks them up. The bottom line is, uh, is that if you're really doing everything you should, whole plant foods give you so much perkiness that you don't need coffee or caffeine. Um, and the other thing is that it takes, they're addicted, caffeine is, it has an addictive substance. It, it gets us addicted. And in a completely mindful space, you want your own faculties to be in control of your decisions. You don't want a substance like caffeine driving your food choices or your beverage choices. So stay away from the coffee. Great, thank you. Uh, Samantha wants to know if a hernia in a woman's abdomen around the bladder, is it dangerous and worth having surgery for? Huh. Well, I don't know exactly what you mean by a hernia around the bladder. I mean, uh, there are umbilical hernias in the belly button, and that you can see because your belly button starts to puff out, and you can push it in, and when it gets serious, you know you need an operation when you push it in and it hurts, or if it's painful, you need an operation. And, and uh, so, you know, there are other kinds of hernias that can develop. The other common ones are in the groin area, if that's what she means, like in the groin. And those are more unusual in women, but they can occur. Um, so the bottom line is if you have pain, that's a sign that you need to have that attended to. Because hernias, once they start causing pain, they're not predictable. And they can start pushing and then you can get into trouble with hernias. So I tell all my patients with hernias, if, they're, if you have discomfort from it, you should address it. So I would go to see, I don't know how this woman was diagnosed with her hernia, whether it was seen on a CAT scan or an ultrasound or an exam. But uh, you know, my experience is surgeons always want to operate on hernias. <laughs> my brother is a, is a hernia expert, he's a surgeon, so I can, I can guarantee you of that. I'm an internist, I'm a, I'm a primary doctor. Primary doctors are a little more low key, 
with the, uh, depending on what the hernia is, I'll let them slide as long as they're stable in size and not bothering anyone and they're not that big. Great, thank you. Uh, -bum. Robin says, what is the best boost to help reseed your microbiome after taking antibiotics? Yeah, uh, so it's, I think it's what we mentioned before. It is eating, making sure you have a diversity of whole plant foods. You get as many plants as from as many species in this world as you can into you. Of course, get all the subsets, you know, the fruits every day and every day that is. And in every meal, as many as you can. Like a lot of us will go, we'll sit there and eat like, uh, what, what, what will we have for breakfast, Chef AJ? Like I'll have a, a bowl of steel cut oats with some blueberries on it and whatever, some flaxseed. And maybe I'll have a banana or whatever. But hey, you can increase the diversity by maybe putting some saffron in, maybe putting um, cardamom, other spices, maybe having some, maybe instead of just oatmeal, maybe having like one of Dr. Greger's specialties, you know, where he puts some legumes and other grains in there. So more, more diversity of plants, because that builds out certain specific uh, wanting species in your ecosystems, that have been, ecosystem that's been depleted by the antibiotic. Number two, um, I, would, um, I would incorporate that codone millet. And, and, uh, and this is from Dr., one of doctors, um, Dr. Gregor's videos, sorghum. Also, those two grains, have staying capacity, their ability to survive digestion as your gut delivers their starches to the colon so you can really uh, bolster your ec good ecosystems down there. And then of course, what I told you before, connect to the microbiome of the soil uh, by eating a, a, a fresh carrot or radish every day that comes from a good soil that's pulled freshly from it. Don't wash it, just white hand wipe it with your hand and then eat it. And that's what I would do. A uh, question, should you take probiotics from a bottle, from the drugstore or, well, that's a complicated question. To tell you the truth, we really don't know um, because no tests, the data that at least I'm aware of hasn't shown that they're really beneficial to us. Um, so that's why I tell you, you know, a lot of them, have that lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. And we know those are soil bacteria in good soil. So eat vegetables from a good soil. Kodo, K-O-D-O, Kodo millet? K-O-D-O. -O. And that's, highly, different th that, that's different than regular millet. Well, there are many different kinds of millets. There are so many different, I don't know, there are 20, many different kinds of millets. This is a specific millet. You could get it on the internet. They often sell it in Indian stores. You know, we know it because uh, Asha Gala, who you should have on someday, I'm recommending. I, you know, I have, I have had her on. Oh, you had? Okay. Yes. Well, I see it in her house all the time because you see it in Indian stores and uh, she cooks with it regularly. It's a staple in Indian cooking, I believe. Nice. Uh, Kathy says, when a person has a total knee replacement, your meniscus and synovial liquid is removed. What foods or lifestyle steps would increase lubrication in a knee once that is removed? Well, quite frankly, uh, you don't really need lubrication in that knee because it's just, it's, it's titanium and plastic surfaces or some kind of cushion. Uh, there is no fluid. Uh, I, well, well, hold it a second. <coughs> I don't, I'm not an ortho, you know, board certified orthopedist. I can't guarantee you that some fluid is not replaced, but the bottom line is you have very, <clears throat> you don't have natural surfaces anymore there that depend on synovial fluid, I believe. So I wouldn't really worry about that. <coughs> what I would worry about is I would worry about your other joints because usually when somebody, especially when they're older and if it's not because of trauma, if they have a one joint that's been replaced, either a knee or a hip usually, the other joint usually is not far behind or, or it has some measure of destruction to it. And for that, eating just a diet of whole plant foods, that's it. 
all the stuff that Chef AJ talks about every day will take away the, there's an inflammatory component that accompanies osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease, that is responsible for the continued decay of your joints and pain. And in my life as a physician, I've noticed that people can come in with severe bone on bone joint disease from osteoarthritis, like in the hip or in the knee, but almost, almost all the time, if they um, adopt a high level of whole plant foods, their pain just goes away. They cancel their operations. They don't even need a, a joint replacement. Did the whole plant foods restore their joints? No, did it, did it, but what it did do is it took away the inflammation component of their joint, which was causing the pain. And so, you know, they can get about their lives and do what they need to. Great, thank you. Uh, Leanne says, what does Dr. Weiss recommend for prostate cancer? Hmm. I recommend diet of whole plant foods. <laughs> So Dr. Weiss is a, a one trick pony. Yeah, Almost I say that way. too. I feel yeah. like that's- yeah. So yeah, it's always the same thing. So the interesting thing is it's always the same answer, but it's the doing that's the difficult part. And that's why Chef AJ is so great because she shows you how to do it. It's the practical nature. So yeah, I mean, uh, so I don't know what stage prostate cancer this gentleman has, but hopefully it's an early stage. Dr. Dean Ornish has demonstrated through his research that early stage cancers, when they're stage one of the prostate, are reversible. It's, it's, it's some of the, the almost the, the little research I know of regarding cancer that shows that whole food plant-based lifestyle can actually reverse cancer. We have evidence of it. And by Dean Ornish. So um, um, yes, I would adopt a diet of whole plant foods. Please concentrate on the following foods for this prostate cancer. In addition to eating that symphony that Colin Campbell recommends, okay? You wanna make sure you have two tablespoons of ground flaxseed every day because flaxseed has lignans in it. They have special properties that help the prostate. Um, you also want to make sure that you have a lot of well-cooked tomato products because those are very high in lycopene. Um, they're the highest commonly available source of lycopene. So here's like an example, Chef AJ, of why it's good not to just have raw diets, right? We, we want to cook things as well. Like if you were to eat a, a, a raw tomato versus if you were to cook the daylights out of that tomato, you have like, like 10 times the amount of this uh, important phytonutrient lycopene, which we believe helps to fight prostate cancer. So a lot of well-cooked tomato products, the ground flaxseed, and then you incorporate in that into the, of course, this goes without saying dark leafy cruciferous greens because they have so many, they're the highest of all cancer fighters in general. You just want to make sure you pack your day with those. Anyone who has cancer, no matter what it is, should make that those dark leafy cruciferous green staples in their diet. Yep. Even at breakfast, even with your oatmeal. You got it. Yeah. Well, Dr. Weiss, we've gone an hour. It's really up to you how long you want to keep going. There's lots of questions, but we know you're going to be coming back. So really, you tell me. Well, I know that I have a patient at 3 p.m., so maybe we can take one more question. I'll answer it really quick, and then maybe if everyone wants me back, and if I haven't worn out my welcome, uh, Chef AJ, maybe next month. That sounds fantastic. And guys, it's much better if you send your questions in in advance because we can't save them from the chat. So I'm asking them in the order received. And the last one will be from Sherry. Recently diagnosed with severe pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. I'm also a diabetic. Are there vegan enzymes that will work or are there only porcine enzymes? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Um, I am, I'm, I am not aware if there are vegan enzymes. There may or may not be. 
you know, there are, I know that, you know, there are, there are plant-based digestive enzymes uh, that you can buy like bromelain and papain. Bromelain comes from pineapple plants and papain comes from papaya plants and they are useful. In, in, but I, I'm not sure, I, they even have data on, on whether these can supplant our own pancreatic digestive enzymes, which are really important to break up fats and other proteins. So um, I think that, um, you know, my, uh, I can look this up too, but I, I have a feeling that it, there may not be a lot of data on it regarding papain and bromelain. But um, I think at this time, if you, if your GI doctor has shown that you have, you, you're not digesting your food because you're missing this, and that would be signaled by fat in your stool and other, you know, stool abnormalities. If you've just demonstrated this, you know, I think um, I would take the enzymes. Listen, sometimes in life, life is not perfect. Uh, Sometimes we have a, a problem, a medical problem, where we, we can't thread the needle with every single perfect treatment. It can't always be a whole plant food. It can be 98% of the time. But sometimes there is a role for modern medicine. Sometimes. It's just, I think that this may be one of those, those cases for you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Everyone wants you back. And it's so funny because I have another medical doctor on Sunday whose name is Dr. Weiss, probably no relation to you, Dr. Joe Weiss, a GI doctor. But Dr. Weiss, just quickly before you go, people are asking if you take patients in Canada and do you see people virtually or only in New York and New Jersey? Uh, we see patients all over the country and world. So uh, if anyone is interested, um, they can go to our website. It's ethosprimarycare.com. And once again, if you uh, want, if you're in our area, or even if you're not, uh, I think it's worth it, you know, to make the trip. We have this spe spectacular Farm Days Festival where you'll get to meet and greet Dr. Clapper and Dr. T. Colin Campbell and Gene Bauer, founder of Farm Sanctuary, Silesh Rao, the great climate activist, uh, and Dr. Furman and myself have these fantastic movement activities. You'll get to visit our farm, eat great food by the Kelling Foundation, and um, take advantage of us. We're here. Uh, uh, real quick, Dr. Weiss, uh, Lisa says she was trying to check out and use the Chef AJ discount, but didn't see a place to put it. Um, you know what? If you, I believe, if you're having any technical difficulties, uh, they can just email through the website at info. Um, Keith, how do, what is our, what is the, um, email to get assistance like at, at Ethos Farm Project? Oh, Keith? Ethos Farm Project. Yes. Ooh, I don't know Ethos Farm Project. I don't know Ethos Primary Care. Huh. Well, give us Ethos Primary Care and Connie will direct. Yeah. So, uh, you can just, uh, email us at patientcare at ethosprimarycare.com. And Connie, uh, Connie, uh, who operates our phones, will redirect the person so that they can get the discount. Great. Well, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful uh, session, Dr. Weiss, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Love you. Thank Take you. Take care. Same here. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Angela Fischetti talking about osteoporosis and strength training for the lower body.